I ask myself if it's an, a, a relic of some a long history, why is there a trillion dollars held in gold by the world's central banks plus the IMF and all of the other financial inst institutions? Uh, during the 2008 crisis, people started to become more aware of this. When Bitcoin came around, suddenly a whole new generation started to understand that the connection between money printing and the Fed and economic weakness. And now uh, I think it's becoming mainstream knowledge that uh, the problem is the Fed. The problem is money printing. The problem is central banks. And until that problem goes away, then expect more uh, pandemics and more financial catastrophes. I'm going to tell you what people need, huh? People need money. Lots and lots of money. That's why the only jobs I'm going to create we're gonna be down at the mint. That's right. We gonna print so much damn money. I'm gonna give every single American one million dollars. Ain't gonna be no more one percenters. Everybody's gonna be million percenters. And then everybody gonna be rich. And nobody gonna have any more problems. And you ain't gotta worry about no damn health care or nothing. And then we gonna have a big ass party with all us millionaires. <laughs> As Dawkins describes it, unless an exchange of favors is simultaneous, and sometimes even then, one party or the other can cheat, and they usually do. This is the typical result of a game theorist called the prisoner's dilemma. If both parties cooperated, both would be better off, but if one cheats, he gains at the expense of the sucker. In a population of cheaters and suckers, the cheaters always win. Albert's I was counting my money late one night when my eyes beheld a most frightful sight. There's only 55 million in my account. So I hatched the plan to get a larger amount. It was a crash. War caused a monster crash. A monster crash. Let's make loads of cash. A monster crash. Get filthy rich in the flash. A monster crash. And I'll increase my stat. I, I like those charts. The uh, Bitcoin versus Bcash hash rate. Uh, yeah, this is a so chart it's, uh, I use. Is that it? Well, I, I usually go to fork.lm. Yeah, I like this one. Okay. Yeah, that, that works too. It's pretty uh, simple, but I kind of like it because you can also, you know, you can put Bitcoin against it and then you can barely see the Bcash hash rate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So obviously we have to just go to the last two years. Uh, uh -huh. And it's been a little longer than two years, but two years is good. Uh, uh -huh. Bcash has now been with us. How long has this plague been around? Two and a half now? Uh -huh. Two and a half, yeah, August 1st, 2017. So uh, right. that, that was uh, more than two and a half years ago, actually. Right, and look, uh, look where Bitcoin hash rate is and look where this disaster is. Yeah, well, Bcash is great. It's, it's great. Look, what, you, we wouldn't have jokes without Bcash. Uh, and he sends me another photo, right? I want people to be able to see this photo, like... Shame, poor Roger. Well, okay, okay, so let, let me explain. So um, it, it was recorded on um, Carando or something. It was a website and they, um, like a sort of HR website, like job seeker website. Um, and it was user generated content. So it was someone who actually said like 50% of Bitcoin.com um, mm. was laid off. Um, so I don't know how reliable that was, but at the same time, yeah. um, at the same time, Roger um, said in an art, like uh, in an interview, that they're going for a leaner approach. Be a Bitcoin billionaire, spending money like I don't care. Basically, confirms that it's real. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. And then leaner Stefan, approach. Yeah, Stefan Rust, <laughs> the CEO of Bitcoin.com. <laughs> left or got fired or he was a guy who added hex you know um oh yeah Jeez. but but but, but I, I, I guess it makes sense because it I, I think they're losing so much money just because they have so many different things and no one's using them they have the local bitcoin <laughs> um which no one uses 
and they have their Bitcoin exchange that no one uses. Um, <laughs> Enter Satoshi Nakamoto, the anonymous programmer who invented Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an open source peer-to-peer -peer payments software, payment program with its own digital currency. What that means is that Bitcoin payments are not in and of themselves backed or redeemed by anything other than Bitcoins. It's not backed by gold or dollars or anything else. So here are a couple key factors about Bitcoin that we'll dive into more in detail. Number one, Bitcoin is open source. Number two, Bitcoin Bitcoin is finite. There's a finite supply of Bitcoins. Number three, the verification of Bitcoin transactions is decentralized, not centralized. Number four, Bitcoin was organically adopted and grew organically. It was never promoted or forced on any group of people by any government. And finally, number five, there is no single or central authority who has any control over the way that Bitcoin operates. So we'll start somewhat near the beginning. I'm trying not to make too many assumptions about your level of understanding of Bitcoin, but as many of us probably know, there is no such thing as a Bitcoin. There are just transaction outputs, and those outputs can be either spent or unspent. So why is it interesting to think about simplicity? So Bitcoin scripts are... Uh, constrained and security focused, but they have expressiveness limitations. And so what Simplicity tries to do is to make the uh, a replacement next generation Bitcoin script system, which is fully general. So you can program, you know, generally arbitrary uh, scripts and programs, and it introduces introspection so that you can look at the context um, Bitcoin script today doesn't have introspection generally. But it doesn't stop there. You can actually have a, a wide variety of different conditionals and you can start creating much more complex scripts. Uh, but a simple next step, for example, from a multi-sig escrow type of script would be some sort of escape hatch. Basically saying, I'm going to put my money into an escrow between three people and if for some reason they can't come to an agreement to spend from it, then after a certain amount of time, the original owner of that money can just have a single signature to get their money back. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the blockchain is just going to keep growing. So, um, you know, there's linear growth there. And I think there has to come a point where we say, okay, well, we have to, we have to stem this somehow um, because this thing is going to, if we want this to keep going on forever, um, IBD time can't scale with forever. So we needed to truncate somehow. And as you can see, these scripts start to become really complex. One of the reasons I didn't like the idea of implementing them was because it would it would use a lot more data on the blockchain. It would make every single transaction in that wallet a lot more expensive. Um, also, there's privacy implications. It would be a fairly unique uh, script. And uh, the nice thing, though, is that hopefully before too long, we'll have a solution for some of those privacy and scalability issues, and we'll be able to have much more complex scripts and, and logical branches of scripts that are essentially hidden through Taproot. Um, simplicity is very low level, so it's a kind of functional assembly language. So it's best to think of it as a kind of almost below assembly language that you would have on a CPU because it's operating on bits and simple types and builds up even simple operations from those. And we'll uh, show, show a few examples in a minute. Um, the point about having these very low level operators is that the semantics are formally specified and that it's a very small core language. So there are only nine operators and some basic types. 
And the point about having formal semantics is that then everything's fully defined and we can then use that as an input to be able to prove things about the script behavior in all conditions. Normally when you're writing software, you test it in all the ways you can imagine using it. Maybe you try to fuzz test it, so try you know, random things to see how well it performs. But with a formal proof system, you can prove things about how the scripts will behave in all possible conditions. So you can sort of make uh, statements about how it will behave and then prove that that's always the case. Uh, if Bitcoin has been around for 10 years, the longer it's around, the more likely it's going to stay around. I need to start thinking, well, maybe Bitcoin will be around for so long that I'll actually be in a position where you know, I want to hand down my Bitcoin inheritance to my children type of thing. So that's an exciting uh, new frontier to get into.